Our next guest is seated right here in this hot seat of the Situation Room. He's Franklin Mukwanja. He's the Executive Director of the Center for Multi-Party Democracy, Kenya. Franklin, good morning. Good morning, Eric. How are you doing? Very well. Good to have you here. Quite chilly, but uh, I managed. Yeah, yes. <laughs> you did, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Last time you were here, it was soon after the election, I think. Shortly before the election. It was before election. We were discussing the amendments. After election, the you haven't come? No, I haven't. Okay, okay. now why haven't you come? Why haven't you come? Why Why is it? It is so elders who determine, and the elder now determine that I should be here today. Yeah. So I'm here. Okay. So, <laughs> so elder. I think this guy is applying that multi party yeah. democracy. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> They've thrown the ball back at you. At you, at you. At you. <laughs> 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 Hi. Karibu Zana Franklin. Thank you so much. City. Party mm. bona multi-party. A multi-party proverb. A democratic proverb. <laughs> a democratic <laughs> proverb. <laughs> <laughs> Our proverbs for the whole of this week come mm. from the Republic of Chad. Mm. The palm tree that encourages birds to nest in it should not cry over shattered leaves a palm tree that encourages birds to nest in it should not cry over shattered leaves yes this proverb is from chad and it told us chad has several ge geographical features it, chad has actually mm. very interesting geographical features mm. within chad you find a part of the sahara desert mm -hmm. within chad you find the sahel somewhere towards the middle within chad you find what you call the sudanese savanna mm. And then there's Lake Chad, which is the second largest wetland in Africa. And then Chad has oh, 200 ethnic groups. Hmm? Multi-ethnic, multi-party. Multi-terrestrial. Multi. <laughs> Multi-everything. Multi-everything. Interesting country, yeah. this. Yes. Hmm? What's your interpretation of that proverb? I think the palm tree invited the birds, mm. uh, so choices have consequences. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Choices have consequences. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. the one who invited the birds. Yeah. And then now they come. When well, yeah. you get broken leaves. Yes. Please. Spare. You rightly know why you got broken leaves, yeah. don't you? Yeah. 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 It's the visitors that you invited. <laughs> yes. You invite visitors. Yeah. And you get broken leaves. Sounds like uh, <laughs> other invitations we've seen lately <laughs> across the political aisles. Uh, yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Now, and we. we when we were saying that you're going to be coming this morning, we said, you know, CMD is actually a body that brings in very many uh, political parties together, right? How many members uh, are there? How many member political parties do you have? We have... Um, the way our membership is determined is after every election. Mm. So after every election, we look at the performance of the parties. And a party that has at least five elected members of county assembly or any other one seat member of national assembly woman rep governor senator or the president is allowed we have such uh, 29 political parties uh, who qualify and merit to be our members but so we 29 political parties have at least one elected representative somewhere yes or five elected MCS MCS. somewhere mm -hmm. and and out of those we have maintained uh, between 19 and 24 uh, since uh, the last general election Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course the big parties in Azimio are your members. Yes, presumably, and, and even in Kenya Kwanzaa, and even in Kenya Kwanzaa, Correct. they're members. Now, what we are seeing now is a lot of this, you know, political pull and push, or push and pull, however you want to approach it. And we're wondering, so what's happening to our political party democracy? The constitution says that Kenya shall be a political party democracy, right? That we shall encourage political parties to actually be vibrant and have different opinions and ideologies that then push forward our democracy. Senor? Yeah. Um, are we living according to the ideals of the constitution, strictly speaking? Strictly speaking, we are yet to get there. Uh, but the journey for multi-party democratic development is not an easy one. Um, forming, maintaining, sustaining political parties is not an easy job. It's not uh, running a corporate or a, or a CSO mm. or, or a religious group. Um, it is about uh, opinions and interests that must be, you know, refreshed every, every time. 
Uh, but our major undoing, in my view, is that while we have a good policy, legal, and, and even constitutional framework to enable us to uh, have um, proper political institutions, we have a challenge of our poor political culture. And, and that is uh, on both ends of the divide. You have uh, generally a citizenry that favors social welfare dispensation mm. at the cost of proper political uh, you know, uh, dispensation in terms of making sure that political parties have policy propositions, making sure that political parties actually have the necessary intra-party uh, democracy and develop the necessary systems, uh, structures, and people in those structures uh, for proper politics. When you look at the interface between elected leaders and the citizens, it is largely a transactional conversation and, and not a, a debate over issues and, and, and what different candidates uh, prefer as solutions to societal challenges. Uh, leaders are elected and elected based on their abilities to, you know, uh, participate in social welfare issues. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife has uh, given birth and, and uh, some of these uh, but uh, akin to Katumani, uh, mm. three months, uh, every three months, you're seeing a gentleman coming, my wife is expectant, and mm. I need to discharge them. Mm. Um, and, and the issues of, of when I was driving here, uh, I kept on hearing about the funding model, you know, of the universities. Mm. And, and, and that is why politicians are keen to control some of these funds, uh, be it the World Fund, be it the Constituency Development Fund, be it the National Agenda for Affirmative Action Fund, even senators are asking for the Oversight Fund. Mm. And if you look at it keenly, Eric, you realize that it's about their capability to be able to interface with those social welfare dispensation. And that poor political culture is, is the, the main underlying issue. Look at the issue of voter bribery, mm. a very basic um, issue in terms of our election conduct. Mm. But it's almost normalized that if you do not... Almost? Uh, it's actually normalized. Thank you. Yeah. Uh. Um, a few of those have, have, have stood their ground and not. And today, they are not even asking that if City is the candidate, that Eric is the middleman and will give. Mm. They have discovered that Eric will run away with uh, part of the share yeah, and want to City the, the candidate to, to, to hand over directly. And, and these issues make our politics untidy. Mm. And therefore, um, politicians, when they go in there, that's why they are interested in pleasing the government of the day pleasing the president to be able to derive something out of it to go back and share with their people as opposed to really uh, representing and am oversight. I, am I hearing listening. you, Frank, saying that the citizen mm. bears the bigger burden of blame here? That we are not because the question was whether we are living according to the ideals of the constitution. I was just prosecuting on the one side. And Remember I said there are two sides. Uh, uh, yes. Or, uh, this side appears to be having a lot of weight. <laughs> let's, hear, <laughs> let's, let's hear the other side. Yeah, so I had <laughs> actually shifted the gear to the other side. Mm. But now when you look at the conduct of the members of parliament largely, the, the way parliamentary business is conducted in house committees. You have had reports about, uh, you know, uh, members of parliament not being keen on, on, on the oversight role, but when they invite the people that they should be questioning about uh, particular issues, they're issues of bribery. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that tells you that the source of money is, 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 is to enable them to, to do their bidding. And then the issue of the funds, as I mentioned, um, the courts have ruled and declared that these funds are illegal. But there is an insistence by the political class to maintain these funds. Mm -hmm. And the question is why? Because voters, again, 
only look at their leaders, not from the frame of how they are performing their duties in terms of legislation, not in terms of how they are oversighting, not in terms of how they are representing their issues, but in terms of how they can be able to give tangible physical things. And that is a misnomer in, in, in the social contract that we have in our politics. You know, I find something interesting here, and I'm really glad you brought this up in the way that you've done, because you've enabled me to look at this thing in a way I'd never looked at it before. Here you have a bunch of people who are elected to represent others. They are the ones who decide they are going to conduct their affairs by introducing bribery, which in an earlier time didn't really exist. People, most people who got voted in were either strong church members of the local church. If you are in certain part of Western Kenya, you are a, you are a Quaker, or you belong to some Pentecostal church, or AIC, or Anglican. The values that were considered to be important in a leader were not money, but the person whom the community thought they were. So this group introduces money. But there's something else that they also do. They also decide that this job, the primary interest is going to be how much money they can make. So this social dishing out of money that you mentioned, it is always presented again by these very people who give the money as something that is demanded. And what is lost in the conversation is who started the giving. It didn't start with the demand from the public, did it? Mm -mm. It was the offers. They offered, they saw and understood this would be a lovely inducement. Now it grew. And why did it grow? Because they then offered more money. And then it get, got to a point where it was ridiculous amounts of money. And that's where what you said comes in. Where does a ridiculous amount of money come in? If you happen to be in a committee that deals with X, Y, Z, those committee meetings deal with money. There are many things to discuss, but at the end of the day, these many things involve expenditure of money in one way or the other. Or someone comes in there because somewhere along the line they were supposed to have money, that money in a particular way, and they choose, to, instead of going left, to go right. And they were told to go right, then they went up instead of down. So money is involved. So this cabal, this class of people now become businessmen. But how they justify the business of taking money which is actually meant for the citizenry is they take it and then they pretend they give all of it to the citizen which they don't they give part of it and they also increase salaries so that we become one of the highest paid parliaments on the planet not just on this particular continent yes indeed there is a contract that contract was skewed such a long time ago that there's a generation that don't even know that there was a time when it was People did not give bribes. They have grown up knowing bribery is how politics is conducted. That was not the contract we signed with these people. We signed a contract that required them to actually ensure that all the services that are due to us are provided. But they actually continuously and consistently determined that that is not what they're going to do. So this discussion is always confused. This, did the chicken come before the egg? No, actually, it wasn't the chicken. It was a duck. No, 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 no. It was a swan. No, 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 no. It was a goose. They're all avian. Yes, but the chicken came before the egg. No, no, no. The chicken was born out of the egg. And so we get into this conversation all the time while their business continues unabated. They are still taking money which they shouldn't take. They are still ensuring that their interest is taken care of first. And the reason why, as you say, GCDF becomes important is because that is where they claim that they are assisting. And we forget, it's still our money, for heaven's sake. It's not as though it's some, it's some gift yes. they've gotten for us. Yeah. And I agree with you, City, because if you look at our politics uh, prior to 1992, there is very little money. And in fact, the campaign at 1992 is a lot more about the campaigning big money in politics. Mm -hmm. But then it is uh, 32 years uh, that we've been at this. It's, it's, it's actually we're cultured uh, to look at that. And, and sometimes I ask, this, what, what is the actual problem? Is it that uh, uh, the politician must uh, give something mm -hmm. when they come into contact with their voters? Or is it that a voter is generally inclined to vote for a generous 
and wealthy, wealthy but generous uh, person, so that they continue giving. And and, and 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 this is an issue that we have to address. And if you look at it keenly, it gives you the answer as to why, for the last, I think, 20, 13, 17, and 20, for the last three general elections, mm. um, we have had a campaign, an election campaign financing act mm. since 20. 12 when it was enacted it has not been you know and if you look at article 88 4i of the constitution it actually speaks to this function of the iebc of regulating campaign financing but yep. that conversation will never go anywhere if you go into ends. public uh, public participation about election campaign financing mm. you you will not find reasonable conversations mm. when you go to parliament there is every reason uh, to stop the implementation uh, and you know and, and, and of, of that particular piece of legislation mm. so our society must be able to reflect and if there is a question of how to to, to fix our multi-party democracy to a modern a democracy to a standard and a culture and practice that we would want, then we have to address the issue of illicit money uh, in our politics because it begins, yes, with the demand by the voters, but then what would be the reason for a member of counter assembly uh, to invest uh, 15 to 20 million into a campaign what would be the reason for a member of parliament to invest 100 million shillings for a campaign when their salary is barely half of that they have ways to raise to recover make the deficit of 40 million and also make some more for the next uh, campaign so it means that electoral politics has then becomes a business. It is a business. So a you, transaction. So you, you've invested to get there. So once you get there now, you are trying to extract as much value out of it. Yes. So when you see these political leaders running and trooping to be in government, they're looking to extract as much because you'll extract the most when you're in the executive. Yes. Because there are the opportunities. And you have had, uh, and, and the question I've seen was whether ODM is going to help uh, Kenya Kwanzaa deliver on its manifesto. And, and uh, my answer is, let's wait and see. Because if you look at the gentlemen and la lady that have been appointed, uh, we can give them the benefit of doubt. If I start with the, the Honorable John Buddy, uh, 15 years in Parliament, uh, a professional accountant, uh, you know, the second degree in strategic management, has been minority leader, sat on various committees. This is someone, and, and his personality is that we understand that he, he wants to stand his ground. Mm. So if it is indeed about his capability and, and, and merit, he actually merits for the job. And if you look at the governor of Paranya, Governor uh, Joho, um, and, and, and the rest, they have some credentials that they bring into this job. Really? But the way, in, in my view, in my view, just if at you look merit at merit level, at, in at terms the of basic qualification, level. do they yes. qualify for the job? Mm, the qualification that you mentioned aren't really the qualification. <laughs> Not really. I mean, what is the basic requirement for someone to be a cabinet secretary? I mean, it, you serve at the discretion of the president. Precisely. Do you need paper qualification? Do you need to have gone to any school of note? Do you, what do you need but to do? But you, you are mm. in a very high level policy making I, I position, am in you know agreement. position i'm in full agreement right? I'm and i'm just looking at uh, honorable bodies you need higher level education you need you know, yeah i'm you looking need. at honorable yeah, bodies yes. mm. experience yeah, yes, yes i've understood i've understood all that yeah. i'm simply asking according to our laws according to the constitution what is the requirement of a cs if we have a requirement what is the educational requirement of a cs the I, I mean you do we have it written down we we do not have it expressly written down in my view that's why it is at the discretion and the pleasure of, of the president okay, exactly yes and the other qualifications you need to be a politician isn't it uh, not necessarily yes you do yes you do we talk about people who would be coming from say the corporate world but you must know this person who is electing you which means you've been involved in politics that's why I say you need to be a politician. You don't need to be a card carrying somebody who has vied for a seat, but you may need to be in that mix. You need to be a political player. Yes, you need to be in that mix. So those, in my opinion, are the qualifications. This thing, whether you went to school or not, secondary. Well, look, you see, we're looking at a, a CS for national treasury that can be able to lift 
this country from the doldrums that is in economically mm. to a level that we're saying we're out of the woods and we're progressing. And possibly if Raila Odinga is honest that uh, the president tapped and His best. We, 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 we gave the experts I, from I, audience. Why do we use the word honesty when referring to politicians? You know, this thing really puzzles me. <laughs> uh, Eric, perhaps you can help me here. <laughs> here we are talking about politics. Must We're talking politics about politicians. Honest. No. The Kenyan politician, by definition, is dishonest. The challenge is to show me one who is honest. I'm sure they exist. Because there are always exceptions to the rule. You know, we can have different definitions of honesty, City. Eh? Honestly speaking. We can define honesty in different ways. Yes. Now, in the Kenyan context of politics and honesty, it's different from many other contexts. Mm. Yes, mm. So don't, don't apply a different uh, grade here. Okay? Apply the grade that applies. Let me descend to the level that we are at. Yes. Isn't oh, it okay? Good. Uh, to the nice murky levels of honesty yes. that we as Kenya yeah. like to sort of like roll in. So as okay. Franklin said, yeah. if so, Raila Odanga was honest, was, that, <laughs> <laughs> was honest enough. Uh, and, and I think the, if I just use the example of uh, the most important portfolio that they have, mm. and that is the Treasury. Uh, they, it's been given to an individual that has the academic part of it, has the legislative and the political experience part of it. But my challenge is that the level of control that they will be demanded may not give them the latitude to be able to do their job in a good way. And, and that is the worry that we have. What are the reasons that ODM possibly joined Kenya Kwanzaa? It may not be for reasons to implement the manifesto. But in my view, it is for the reasons. And yesterday, uh, if I read the statement that ODM is synonymous to protests, they to me, it sounded like they have an entitlement to protest, including the Gen Z-driven protests. And, and therefore, they fear that their forte was being taken away from them, made it possible and easy, in my view, for them to have an elite settlement and join government so that they can steady the nation. And, and I think if it's, it's a manifesto of steadying the nation, I think that has been realized. The rest, we will it's a wait and see. And... I have little confidence in it because if you listen, to, if, if, any, if anything that has to be trusted away from Raila, and if Raila actually has to be believed that he speaks largely through <laughs> his uh, henchmen, mm. then when we see what, uh, what, what Atandi and the others have said about this government only being bad mm. because our people are not inside, then we have the answer already. This is that the, the initial why. intention of joining government was not actually uh, to help in realizing. And, and if you look at even our, 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 our setup, we are a minority. Uh, we, we are a, a, a presidential system with the recognition of a minority. Mm. Legally, there is nothing you can hold against ODM. Uh, for for joining for joining the Kenya Kwanza side. Hold on, and we'll uh, come we'll come and discuss that shortly. <laughs> Franklin Mukwanja is the executive director of the Center for Multi Party Democracy in Kenya. We are looking at what we've seen in the, in the politics recently. So ODM uh, joining Kenya Kwanza administration, end of Azimio near as partners fight it out. That's a headline in the Standard this morning. Um, the Standard in the Nation today is saying Raila snubs Uhuru talks. <laughs> So ODM did the thing that it did, um, had these talks with the Kenya Kwanzaa and four of its top leaders joined the government. And in fact, five of its top leaders joined the government, right? Now, Azimio is, the other members of Azimio are not happy. And a meeting is then called by the Azimio Council Chairman uh, Uhuru Kenyatta yesterday and ODM before that meeting comes out guns blazing and says, we understand that that meeting in the afternoon is going to discuss uh, moving, kicking us out of the party and demeaning our party leader, Raila, and we are not going to attend it. So meeting does not take place. What's going on here, Franklin? Let's 
begin the conversation in Article 108 mm. uh, that uh, speaks to the majority and minority uh, leadership. Mm. We, we are a minority, we are a presidential system with a minority leadership. Mm. And, and that must not be confused with the, the other systems like uh, leaders of opposition in Westminster model uh, democracies, uh, opposition leaders in multi-party parliamentary democracies, or even leader of opposition in uh, presidential hybrid uh, systems. Mm. And, and uh, uh, constitutional and even legally, uh, you will agree with me uh, that uh, there is absolutely no illegalities in what ODM has done. Uh, because in terms of being the minority party, it is about the numbers. And, and, and that is it. Minority, that is what article... Minority in parliament. Yes. And, and that, is what the, that is what the law provides for. Okay. When you go what to... Is the, what is the spirit? Yes. And that's where I'm headed. Okay. When now you get to the aspects of unwritten but well-accepted convention or norms, mm. ODM is out of order. Mm. Because you can't have your cake and eat it. All right? You cannot pretend on one end of the mouth that you are deputy party leaders, you are chair of the party, and you are minority leader have been tapped by the president without the political party being in some sort of agreement <laughs> with, with, with the president. Yeah. And, and that is where I agree with the, the and elder then, city. And crossing from then from the minority <laughs> to the majority. Yeah. And, and then hold on to the minority because... While democracy is characterized by uh, partisanship, mm. it also demands some degree of cooperation, mutual respect, forbearance, um, and toleration. Mm. And it is expected that a minority leadership in, in, in a setup like Kenya will be able to offer alternative, will be able to make sure that this debate uh, on issues. And, and I do not see this coming out. So there is a heavy imbalance in this. That where there is toleration, where there is cooperation, where there is mutual respect, where there is forbearance, Honor Boraila Odinga is keen on it. But where the opposition is required to present a voice, mm. to be able to scrutinize, uh, to offer alternatives, to prevent abuse of power, Honor Boraila Odinga is not keenly on that and and that is where my problem comes in that we are not respecting the basic tenets of a multi-party democracy we are not respecting the basic tenets unwritten but well accepted conventional norms on how we should function as a nascent multi-party democracy and, and that is where i draw the line that we must be able to say that in terms of Ill illegalities there is no problem but in terms of sanity uh, ODM is making this untidy. Is this then the wrong thing that we took up as Kenyans? Uh, possibly we need to rethink our architecture. Because of, if you look of, at of it, governance. and city keeps reminding us all the time, you know, issues of cooperation and handshake in are uh, always taking place in various administrations. And this is to stabilize and to sanitize, not to, to stabilize systems, <laughs> right? He reminds us, for example, after the referendum of 2005, and Mwai Kibaki dismisses his entire cabinet because renegades within his government had campaigned against a position that others in his government, including himself, had campaigned for in the Chungwa, Machungwa, and Banana referendum of 2005. And so he reaches out to the other parties that are not part of the NAC. He brings in Shimeon Yachai. He brings in members who are in Kanu. Even if Kanu's chairman, Uhuru Kenyatta, does not join government, but Kanu leaders join his government. And he expands that cabinet and assists the ministers to plus 60. So he can try and minimize the numbers of the new LDP wing that's forming ODM. We see the same again after the forced uh, handshake after our post-election violence, again with Uhuru and Raila, again now we are seeing, maybe this is the nature of our politics, or maybe it's a reflection of the bad manners of our political leaders. It's either of those two. It's either the nature of our politics, or it's become normalized over time 
by the poli- because we are mentioning the same names as we are talking about all these things. Yeah. It's I, only Kibaki who's died. Yeah. I, I agree that we just not have a problem in our system of, of governance. We also have a, a problem with our, our system uh, and our electoral system design. But let me first uh, look at the system of governance. It, you know, it is not possible that in a country so competitive uh, politically like ours, where the margins are so small in terms of presidential elections, uh, to state that once you have uh, contested and you cannot have a soft landing, uh, you are out of the game. And it may not be, and we have tried it and it's not working, that then you have Raila Odinga donating his influence to, uh, you know, someone junior called a minority leader to go in and sit. They will be out there looking for something bigger. And and, and, and we need to rethink about that, whether we, we need to find ways of the running mate, the, the candidate and the running mate that comes uh, like in politics, we say they didn't lose, they didn't get enough votes to be declared the winners. The candidate that didn't get enough votes to be declared the winner find themselves on the floor of the house to lead their troops because they need this opportunities for influence, for patronage, for the office, for the trappings and the salary that gives them the status of their votes. And I think there's, there's something there, there mm-hmm. that we need to iron out. On the part of uh, our electoral system design, it's, it's a conversation that we have avoided and I think can sort us a, a, quite a bit. If you look at the combination of our money in politics, our patriarchy, um, uh, you know, our, our ethnic way of doing politics combined with fast past the post as our system uh, of uh, electoral system design, we will always land in the same challenges, all right? We, we have avoided conversations of whether there are other electoral system designs like mixed proportional representation mm. or uh, proportional representation that can actually help us get some level of fair representation, including making sure that we achieve gender equality and social inclusion. Mm. Uh, but as long as we keep on doing this same thing and avoiding the actual conversation, I, I, I think we'll not be able to sort out the critical problems. On one end, we, we, we gave ourselves a minority uh, in a presidential system, which I think is problematic because mm. you leave out very influential actors without uh, critical offices and, 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 and positions of influence. And then on the other side, you have an electoral system design that brings, that, that, that makes sure that elevates money, elevates patriarchy, elevates, you know, uh, ethnicity. Mm. And, and that's why the big five will always be colluding in terms of arranging uh, coalitions you know, uh, to win power. Every time we actually talk about um, an election, a lot is not given to our electoral system, it comes to the governance system. And we talk about whether we want a parliamentary system, a presidential system, a mixed system. But now that you bring up the issue of the electoral system, and you brought, you know, the, whether mixed proportional representation or full proportional representation, what's that? Can you give us examples of proportional representation and how different it would be with what we have in Kenya? If, if you look at uh, countries like uh, Rwanda, uh, with their mixed uh, member proportion representation. Mm. Uh, if you look at the majority of, uh, even South Africa, uh, you know, I look at the majority of the Nordic countries, uh, Denmark, uh, Sweden, uh, you will see that their democracies have developed largely. What happens in Rwanda? Just take us through. But people who don't know. If, if, if you look at the, the electoral system of, of, of South Africa and Rwanda, mm. you realize that there is an election happens. Mm-hmm. And the whole idea is elections are done in a way that political parties make presentation of lists that meet particular uh, you know, a criteria mm. uh, in terms of, of gender, in terms of, of, of majority of minority and marginalized group representation. So you have all those intersectionalities that are 
put in to before make sure the election. before the elections mm. so that by the time you're getting to the ballot and you're making the choices of the political party possibly uh, Rwanda out of its uh, challenges may not be a very good example to many Kenyans ears but if you look at South Africa and look at even more developed countries you'll see that we have a better chance as a society in terms of our challenges of unfair representation in terms of uh, in inability to meet the gender threshold, mm -hmm. we would be much better sorted with a different electoral system desi design okay. so what than happens, the FPTP. What happens, Frank? People who don't know, what happens in South Africa? How do people elect their leaders in South Africa? Compare that. We know how we elect our leaders in Kenya. Yeah. It is Frank and Siti yeah. and Eric on the ballot paper. And we select Frank, right? Either because uh, we like him or because he's in the mm -hmm. right party. So the main Either of those two things, yes, or because he's like we don't know any of these guys, we're just looking for the beautiful face. The main difference here uh, is that you have a list that has been developed through a specific criteria for each political party, mm -hmm. all right, and the vote is actually given uh, to the political party with full knowledge of who are going to be elected representatives when you're giving ODM or UDA or, 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 or you know, or, or, or ANC. So what's or on the ballot? What is on the ballot is actually the political party. It's not the name of an individual. Yes. So people, you go there and you say, I want to vote for UDA. Yes. Or NAC Kenya. But with a clear mind of who are the ones coming in when I vote for UDA. Yeah. And this list has been generated out of an accepted criteria of how our society should be represented. And that then, you're saying, that addresses the very many issues. Because I mean, you will, by the time the parties are presenting their lists, they have all these. They have gender, they have You, you have all the intersectionalities, you have, you have the PWDs, youth, you, have you have the minorities, and all that. And, and I believe that can be of help to us, uh, as opposed to a system that uh, elevates, you know, big ethnic groups because it's about numbers that makes it possible for money to determine uh, winability and then brings in patriarchy uh, because who are the people that have control over utilization of and access to financing and other resources that can enable them uh, to be able to earn the, 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 the victory. Mm. It is actually uh, elderly men and, and that becomes a, a critical issue in, in, in our elections. You know, look at South Africa and look at the outcomes of the elections. Yes, parties take center stage in the political activities. Parties decide who is the president if they have the numbers. Okay. Now, what we see now for the first time in South Africa, uh, the, something that they have never had since they got their independence. This time around, they have to bring in other players to join their government. The majority that they have enjoyed ceased to exist. Now, if we look at our country, and you're comparing to South Africa, we've had a former South African president jailed. We've had parties removing their president, saying this particular fellow, we need to replace him. Now, it's something that they have, and it's how they work. We've had opportunities to change and to do something that would suit our purposes. And arguably, you could say, what we have seems to be what we chose. Or those whom we opted, or whom we selected to represent us, decided that this is the path that we should follow. Because that model, I'm using it as an example, was available. But we did not choose it. That moment was there. And when we talk about moments in this country, we always talk about them whimsically with this notion in mind that we have many missed opportunities. It seems to be what we do best. We miss opportunities. But then the question is, did we really miss an opportunity? Or is this part of our political journey? I, I reckon it's part of our political journey because uh, when you're in a constitution-making moment, it's a give and take. Uh, there were critical issues at, at that moment. And, and uh, the ones were whether we have devolution or, or, or we go back to the center 
or whether you have a parliamentary or presidential system. And, and, and I think there was a give and take in, in exchange of those who wanted devolution so badly uh, and at the same time wanted a parliamentary system had to give in, give in for devolution and give out. Uh, the parliamentary system and those ones that wanted a presidential system got it and the ones that, uh, that they didn't want devolution at the same time had to sacrifice with that so we made some gains at that level but if you look at the bbi report actually uh, stakeholders like ourselves put in these issues very keenly and we again put in uh, these qu questions in the national dialogue uh, committee nadico report because as actors political actors we have seen and consistently argued that this country will not be able to get to the next level of fair representation with gender equality and social inclusion if we continue using the first past the post in an environment uh, that we we operate in where money is a, a key determinant in our politics where ethnicity is is, is the ban of for mobilization in our politics where you know patriarchy again is, is is dominating and with this poor political culture then we have to rethink what can be the fix for this uh, that said we have the aspect of the citizen agency which is uh, quite interesting that uh, has come out that if you look at the way the young people uh, so-called the gen z's have put their case across is that they're actually challenging these issues uh, about we are being t we, are, we are tribeless we, we we are partyless we are leaderless because they are questioning the viability of the political parties that are there in their current form and shape right they want some more substance in it mm. so while we continue the conversation of rethinking our electoral system design we must encourage city this conversation that the young people have brought on the table yeah that it's largely about our political culture that must be shifted for us to be able to get to the next level those in charge of the culture will not accept <laughs> And we have seen those in charge of the culture. Are I think they have been largely scared by the, the moves, and that is why they mm. quickly went into this so-called, uh, you Marriage know, of convenience, uh, offering experts to the other side uh, to help in steadying the nation. How long do you think that's going to last? Um, I, I want to be optimistic that uh, because we aren't clear of uh, if William Ruto was to exit, then who or what next? Mm. Uh, we, uh, the only point I agree with the president is that we are a democratic country mm. and we made our decisions in 2022. We have an opportunity to make those decisions in 2027. If this agitation can continue and the government can continue to respect the rule of law, which is something alien to them, yeah. uh, and then continue the conversation and help these young people understand mobilizing, organizing, and coming out to be able to make their decisions and, and, and negotiate for a, mo a much better social contract in 2027, I think that is the farthest I would want to go with, with this current arrangement. And, and, and I think the only way to shift this country is to shift our culture and be able to make sure that we are fixing the anomalies in our social contract. The culture should be fixed before 2027. Yes. Franklin, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for coming today. By the way, today CT is our birthday. On the 20th of August, five years ago, uh, Spice FM was officially launched. Happy and birthday. This show went officially on air. Happy 20th of August, yeah. five years ago. So today, Frank, birthday banner. Happy birthday. Mm. I will uh, see what to do if I can <laughs> bring you a cake. <laughs> that will be great. Good. But I'll also be making a point to come back here yes. on the, the week of 15th. Mm. Uh, maybe uh, 15th is, 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 uh, is a Sunday, but uh, maybe the week. The week before yep. or the week after mm -hmm. is the International Day of Democracy. And we can delve deeper into some of these critical Fantastic. issues. Fantastic. Of, of how our, do we... Our dying democracy. Country. Thank you. Okay. This is The Situation Room. The only way to start your day.